Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, our distinguished guests and other participants. Welcome to today's webinar on the fascinating topic of ethics is about leadership, full stop. We are honored to introduce our esteemed speaker, Brian Adams, who's widely known as the ethics architect in business ethics parlor. With over 30 years of experience in the field of corporate risk management, Brian has been instrumental in shaping ethical practices and frameworks for um, num numerous companies in South Africa. Brian's extensive knowledge coupled with his passion for ethics has made him a sought after speaker, uh, an author and an advocate in the realm of business ethics. Throughout his career, Brian was uh, involved in diverse industries from multinational corporations to nonprofit organizations, uh, helping them all to navigate the complex ethical challenges that arise in today's fast-paced and interconnected world. Uh, Brian's expertise extends beyond theoretical frameworks. I mean, those of us who know him well knows that he brings a very practical approach to ethics. And uh, obviously, his, his ethics pizza methodology is well known uh, as a very practical framework to deal with those issues. His insights and thought-provoking ideas have inspired countless individuals. Those of us who follow him on LinkedIn will know that he's very outspoken on, on issues. Um, you know, and today, uh, Brian will go deeper and he will delve into that multifaceted world of organizational leadership, shedding light on years of experience and insights that he attained in the field. So get ready for an enlightening session. Um, I'm very excited. That will obviously challenge your thinking, broaden your perspective and provide actionable insights. And I think that's the most important is the actionable and very practical insights Brian's going to bring to us. Um, please join me in warmly welcoming Brian. Thank you, Brian, for joining us. And without further ado, let's begin this inspiring webinar. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Stefan, and uh, good morning to Cynthia. And thank you, Sarah, for all your help and assistance. Uh, I'm very pleased that you mentioned the word navigate, uh, uh, Stefan, because uh, I just wanted to quickly talk about this logo of mine. Uh, and it's it's got two edges to the sword, if you like. The one is navigation. And in a sense, it helps organizations navigate their way through the very rocky and sometimes very stormy environment that we find ourselves in. And then the second edge of the sword is really to, to shine a light on all the stinky, nasty malfeasance that's happening in, in, in the world around us. So uh, really what we do need at the moment, if anything, <laughs> if anybody needs any further nudging to uh, to indicate that to anybody is that we need this we need to shine a light on all the on all the fraud and corruption and disgusting stuff that's happening and we also need leaders especially to sh to show the way to to highlight the safe passage that ships need to take and uh, uh, I, i'm hoping that i'm going to lift the little the little veil the corner of the veil this morning on some of my thinking with regard to to leadership um, before we start, I'd just like to just ask a question. I know Sarah is normally very good with polls and things, but this won't be a poll because it's a question that I want to ask you now, and I'm hoping that by the end of the talk, um, the answer is going to become very apparent. But I'm going to ask it anyway, and that is, what is the one single thing that is going to turn South Africa from a country plagued by dishonesty and corruption into an ethical one? So at the end, I'm going to ask you again, and then I'm going to uh, pull, uh, do a set platter uh, and pull out the envelope from uh, the answer out of an envelope. Uh, but then by then, I hope you would have all worked out exactly what the answer is. Uh, interestingly, it's almost 36 years and 10 days to the day that uh, I did a sort of a pilgrimage, if you like, to the beaches of Normandy in northern France. Uh, when I it was on my bucket list, and I always wanted to go and, and visit the place to see what happened on the 6th of June, 1944, when the, this huge, massive Allied army invaded Northern France and started the, 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 the battles, the, uh, which eventually led to the overthrow of Nazism and the liberation of, of, of Europe. And um, while, while I was wandering around on a, on a drizzly, cloudy day, uh, my wife stayed in the rental car because uh, it was the, the weather wasn't great but I wasn't about to pass up on the opportunity to walk around on an area that I'd, I'd read so much about. And when I got back into the car, 
my wife said to me, okay, um, I found a place where we're going to go now. And I, I said, fine, because we normally did things like that uh, until I got tired of going to art galleries and museums. But anyway, this one looked quite exciting. So we went along to uh, about eight kilometers away from the beaches to a little village called Bayeux. And it's, as you can see from the slide, it's a beautiful medieval village. And the highlight of this village is not the beautiful architecture, but in fact, something which is called the Bayeux Tapestry. And for those of you that know anything about history, uh, will know that the Normans, as they were then in those days, invaded uh, Southern England as it was in those days. And then the, the great battle of Hastings took place in 1066. And that started with the, 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 the Norman, Normanization, if you like, of, of England, which took hundreds of years and led to huge changes in the culture and the language and all those kind of things. But what's absolutely amazing about this place is that there's this tapestry, which is actually not a tapestry at all. It's actually an embroidery, but it's 60 meters long and it's about 600 millimeters high. And it's, it's done with wool, principally, on cotton and, and on, on linen sheets. And it apparently was done by about 200 Norman women when they'd already settled in Kent in Southern England. And it depicts, as you can see, it depicts the landings of the, uh, of the Normans in Southern England and all the battles and everything that took place. Why am I on earth am I talking about this as an introduction to my talk this morning? Well, it suddenly dawned on me. I was fascinated by this and I started reading up about it and I started seeing more and more about it. And what was amazing to me was that if one looks at the front of the tapestry or the embroidery as I believe it is, you'll see that it looks as if one person's done it. But if you look at the back, you can see that there are maybe 200, they estimate, different women that put their, their stitches into this beautiful embroidery. And the, the immediately it dawned on me that that is exactly like an organization. It's got to have this unified, beautiful brand that the, the organization uh, portrays to the world around it and its customers and everybody else that's a stakeholder in the organization. But behind it, the thing that makes it beautiful, the thing that makes it uh, um, an extremely valuable thing is the fact that all the people that are involved in this organization put their stitches in faithfully every day. So I came up with a definition that I, I use which for ethics, which is that ethics is a set of beliefs that have been woven into the fabric of your organization. And the second step is that they're embraced by everyone from the top to the bottom. So it's quite pointless having a beautiful Bayer tapestry. It's quite pointless having beautiful missions and visions and value statements on your website and in your boardroom if they're not embraced by everybody from the top to the bottom. And that's really where the rubber meets the road. And that's what I'm hoping that I'm going to touch on a little bit more during the talk. You see, one of the things which, which really bugs me, and I'm sure it does for a number of you as well, is that when I, I talk to my clients and prospective clients who are invariably top managers, executives of various organizations, some of them even to this day say to me, Brian, can you do ethics for us? And sometimes I have to bite my tongue because it's, very, very difficult for me not to say a cheek, make a cheeky remark or say something uh, which borders on rudeness. But you see, the point is that I can't uh, do ethics for an organization in the same way that I can't shower on behalf of anybody else. I can certainly hose somebody down with a, with a, with a garden hose if necessary, but there's no way that I'm going to jump into a shower with, with, with uh, certainly not with a guy. So the point that I try to make is that ethics is not a department or a project undertaken by some external consultant. And that's where so many organizations get it wrong. They think they can just abdicate it. They think they can just find some old dear or some old guy that's got five years to go before they go on retirement. And then they give them the ethics portfolio and then they're happy to say that they can tick another box on the dear old uh, King Four checklist or some other corporate governance checklist. You see, one has got to establish very clearly, I'm just going to move this thing a little bit. One has got to establish very clearly who owns ethics in your organization. It's not something that has got to be owned only by top management. Everybody has got to embrace it, as I said earlier. And that's, to my mind, is the, the difference between success and failure in an organization. 
if it's something that only top management is talking about, if it's only something that top management is doing, you're on a hiding to nothing. The secret of leadership is getting everybody in your team to follow the, the, the guidelines and the vision and mission that top management have set for that organization. The question is, who's losing, losing sleep over it? Who is waking up in the middle of the night saying, wow, are we doing the right thing? Should we be doing that? Shouldn't we rather be doing that? You see, ethics has to be intentional. It's not something that just happens. It's not something that is that just one day is going to be there. Top management have got to decide that that is the path they're going to take. That is the course they're going to take. It's got to be something. It can't also, before I, uh, I forget to mention it, it can't be uh, a couple of lever arch files that some expensive consultant has, has, has drawn up and that has been handed over to the client and the client has put it into a very nice glass-fronted cabinet in the boardroom. That's not what ethics is about. Ethics is about your lifeblood. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But ethics is not something that you can spoon feed. It's not a passive thing. It's not something that happens by osmosis. You know, some of the people that attend my, my, my workshops and my courses and my lectures, especially the ones that I present on entrepreneurship, those that buy my book on entrepreneurship, think that just by buying the book, by some miracle, they're going to become uh, experienced and successful entrepreneurs. It doesn't work that way. As Oprah Winfrey said, um, you can't take the, the escalator. You can't take the elevator, elevator. You've got to use the stairs. You've got to put in the hours. You've got to make this thing a practical uh, uh, project that you deliver, which is absolutely part of your life plan. And also, just to end off, end off ethics doesn't happen by, by supernatural intervention. It's not something that one day you're going to wake up and there's going to be a, 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 a flash of light and suddenly you're going to have an ethical organization. Some people might believe that. Some, can, some consultants might tell you that. But I can tell you now it's a lie. It doesn't work that way. In the real life out there, it doesn't work that way. So ethics is the questioning, it's the discovering, and it's the defending of our values. You see, there are quite a lot of verbs there, or adverbs. But ethics essentially is a verb, as far as I'm concerned. Ethics is a doing word. It's not something that is just there. It's something that happens. It's dynamic. It's something that is an ongoing process. And that's something we need to understand. And when I talk about ethics in relation to you and your organization, I'm actually talking about your lifeblood. And what is more important than your lifeblood? Absolutely nothing. And yet my colleagues, my peers, uh, everybody out there that's watching, how many of us haven't experienced something where people see ethics as still something that's a sideshow? that you just create a department, you find a couple of people, you put them in there, and you hope that you're going to have ethics. Well, I need to dispel that immediately. If you haven't already understood the realities of the situation, ethics doesn't work like that. You see, ethics speaks to your DNA. It speaks to your identity. As I mentioned earlier uh, with the Bayeux Tapestry, it speaks to your brand. That which the people see from outside, that beautiful picture, is your brand, it's your reputation, it's your sustainability. It's not something that is just created one day by a consultant, as I say, ad nauseum. It's something that's got to be built over time. You see, your sustainability is, your, is determined by your ethical capital. As I said in a post a couple of months ago, some people don't even know what ethical capital is. Ethical capital is more important, as far as I'm concerned, than any other form of capital. And some of you might recognize this delightful lady on the slide right now. And she is, of course, the chairperson of our organization. But she also wrote a book, a very, very valuable book, which I recommend to everybody that I speak to. And in that book, she talks about the new ROI, which is return on integrity. And a lot of people are still conflicted about whether they should go for the old ROI, which is a return on investment, or the new ROI. And one thing that's absolutely clear to me is that there's no conflict. The one is not better than the other. They are like a left and a right hand. They have to work together in concert. And the return on integrity, as far as I'm concerned, you cannot have a return on investment and have a sustainable business if you don't also have the new ROI. You have to have that new ROI. You have to build an ethical culture. Because what have I just said in the previous slide? Your sustainability is determined by your ethical capital. 
And how do you build ethical capital? You build it by the way you do business, by the way you relate to your, your stakeholders, your customers, your suppliers, your subcontractors, and all those people that are part of the success of your business. So I'm a, I'm a, a disciple of this new ROI. I talk about it every day. I talk about it to, ever, to whoever I can. And I believe that that is the secret that we're going to, it's going to be the linchpin that's going to decide whether we as ethics uh, practitioners are going to be successful in, 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 in achieving a tipping point in our, in our work with our clients and in the organizations where we live and work. Stefan, you kind of in, introduced me to this a couple of years ago, and that is this massive NGO in America, which has this incredible system where they rate companies uh, on the basis of ethics. And they've determined that the, the most ethical companies, according to their definition, have got a, over a very measured over a five year pre, uh, period, show a premium of 24.6% on the old ROI, on, it can, on financial return on investment. So ethical companies actually show a premium of 24.6% over companies with, which aren't as ethical. And that's why I'm busy writing my new little book called Building Value Through Values. Because I believe that, and I'm, I know I'm speaking to the choir here, but we need to convince everybody else out there that the only way to have a successful, sustainable business over the long term is to build value through values. We all know this from the Ethics Institute, or at least that's where I was introduced it. But a lot of people think that it's okay to be uh, unethical at survival level, as long as you eventually, when you become successful and uh, you get uh, to the sort of the mega business stage that you then become totally aligned. One example of that is Branson, because Branson by his own admission, when he started Virgin Records all those many years ago, he wasn't really running a very ethical business. But now of course he's, he's a global spokesperson uh, or he, he likes to think he is a global spokesperson on ethics and ethical behavior. You see, as we climb up this ladder as businesses, we have to realize that every step of the way, we are going to create stronger reputations. We're going to create stronger links. We're going to create stronger relationships with all our stakeholders along the way. And that in the end is going to lead to what? It's going to lead to sustainability, going to lead to profitability. So we're not talking about sideshows here, guys. We're not talking about something fluffy and warm that you put away in a cupboard. We're talking about real life business, real life economic activity where the rubber meets the road. Stefan alluded to my ethics picture with, with pizza, which I'm having a lot of fun with, I must say. And it all started, for those of you that don't know, it all started probably about six, five or six years ago when I was doing my, uh, my EPA qualification. And as part of that qualification, as you know, most of you know, uh, you have to do a little mini thesis. And what I did is I developed a, uh, an ethics survey, which I conducted on a sample with one of my JSE listed clients. And uh, while I was doing that, almost parallel to it actually, I was thinking about the fact that because I was really one of the pioneers of reporting services and I started Tipples Anonymous and I subsequently started Be Heard, which is our current service, um, I was trying to work out the dynamics of why some organizations have fantastic results with their reporting services and others have none at all. And one day I was actually in Rosebank, funnily enough, visiting a, a very successful client of mine. And while I was sitting there having a, a cup of coffee with him, it suddenly the, the thing started to fall into place in my mind. The things that he was doing right in their organization, and those were the things that were leading to the successes. And subsequently, when I got to, in fact, it, it's, it's etched in my mind, I got to, to mug and bean in, um, um, in Centurion. And I suddenly sat down, I had a cup of coffee, another cup of coffee, and I suddenly started drug, uh, writing it all down. And suddenly this ethics pizza uh, sort of came, fell into place. And what it is basically very simply is that it is eight critical success factors which determine the success or failure of a reporting service. But as I said in the beginning, this was happening parallel to the, 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 the ethics training that I was doing through the Ethics Institute. And suddenly another, one day I had another eureka moment and I suddenly realized that, hang on, 
these eight crit critical success factors are as um, reliable and as, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, as important, if you like, in the greater ethics picture, in building an ethics organization. So it doesn't only apply to reporting services. And what I've subsequently discovered, as I mentioned, I'm having so much fun with this, is that it, it actually works in exactly the same way to, uh, to measure and to encourage, if you like, an organization to become totally successful. So it's, it's morphed itself into being something far more than just a measure of how successful a reporting service are. And the important thing that I want to touch on today of the eight are the top two, desire and intent, which is the owners or the, the top managers have to absolutely be committed to introducing an ethical structure, to being ethical, to, having, uh, to entering into an ethical journey. The second one is leadership. The rest are absolutely critical as well. Not one of these. And I've tried to find a way of weighting them. I'm working on that at the moment. But what is more important, building trust or shared values? What's more important, creating a, a culture of awareness and communication or having consequence management? I'm still going through that. And if any of you have got any in, in inputs on that, I'd love to hear about it. But I'm going to be posting something shortly on LinkedIn. The most important thing as we kick off this is that desire and intent is absolutely fundamental. It's ridiculous and it's, it's ludicrous and it's not even worth thinking about an organization introducing a reporting service for that matter or starting an ethics journey if they're, if they're in an ethical desert. And unfortunately, I hasten to add that I have clients, uh, I've lost one last, uh, last month after 10 years and eventually I was actually quite delighted to lose them. I wasn't delighted to lose the money, but I was delighted to lose them because over 10 years, they have done absolutely nothing to encourage the use of the reporting service or to build an ethics uh, culture in the organization. And, you know, one gets to a point where one says you can, you can take a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. Um, and the only reason why they had the service was because it's, it, it's, it, it's um, a requirement of a whole lot of corporate governance uh, checklists. So they said, we need one, you good to go, off we go and we'll do it. You see, King also talks about uh, leading and it's point principle 1.1. And that is that the governing body should set the tone and lead ethically and effectively. You see, once again, it's not effectively and ethically, it's ethically and effectively. And I like that because it's once again, the two hands. It's the old ROI and the new ROI, they're inseparable. You can't have the one without the other to have a successful business in the long term. So what we have here is we have this, this, um, the, these slices of the pizza and we're gonna just touch on for the rest of the talk, we're gonna touch on, on leadership pr principally and the importance that it plays in building an ethical structure or building an ethical business, or in fact, building an ethical society. And Hennessy said that ethics must begin at the top of an organization. And I'm speaking to the choir again, because we all know that it is a leadership issue and the chief executive must set the example. Well, I know some of you might even be smiling at this because the reality is in some cases very, very far, far from this. You see, what I said earlier is that ethics cannot be something that is just driven by top management. Ethics has got to be something that everybody has to embrace. Embrace is the word that I use because embrace, it's not, it's more than buying into it. It's embracing it. It's actually feeling that it's part of you. It's, it's loving it. It's fearing it. It's being proud of it, all those kind of things. And unless all your people in your organization embrace it and become leaders in their own right, you're heading for a hiding, you're on a hiding to that. So it should be absolutely clear that when I talk about leadership here, I'm not talking about top management only. I'm talking about leadership at every level. You see, leadership is about this comes from uh, John C. Maxwell, and he's written a hell of a lot about leadership, and a lot of it is very good stuff. But this is really at the core of all of the stuff he's written. Leadership is about knowing the way. It's about having the vision. It's about knowing enough about what you're doing to know that that is the direction that you should take. It's about showing the way. It's about formulating plans, 
It's about formulating strategies and tactics to get in the, to the direction that you want to go. And then it's about going the way. What I believe is absolutely fundamental about this is that the, the leader at every single level has got to set the example. He can't say, okay, guys, off you go. Don't do that. He does. He, he delegates and he, as part of the whole system that we work through. But there's an old saying that you can't, a leader, a good leader, should not expect people to do anything that he would, need, what he would not do himself. So leadership is about knowing the way, it's about showing the way, it's about going the way. And that's where my favorite animal, my favorite cat certainly, uh, is a perfect metaphor for that. You see, I love lionesses and I love them more than lions because lions generally tend to, oh, okay, do they, they protect the pride and all that kind of good stuff. But generally, they seem to lie around in the shade most of the time. They uh, push all the other lions out of the way when a kill is made. And, uh, of course, they make other little lions. But generally, they, uh, they're not the most, uh, the biggest contributors to the, the, the success and sustainability of the pride. The person that is, is the head lioness. And that's what, oh, I love that uh, metaphor, if you like, of, of her as far as leadership is concerned, because she's engaged. You see, she doesn't run her organization from the corner office with the pretty secretary and the big uh, six-figure motor car in the garage overlooking the golf course, uh, running the organization from his or her uh, cell phone or, or tablet or, or laptop. She's out there. You can see she's in the danger zone. She's right within the striking distance of the buffalo horns. She's in front. She's showing the way to her, to the other women, the other lionesses in the pride. You see, as far as I'm concerned, and you cannot get away from it, you cannot convince me otherwise. In all my experience, in the military and in, in civilian life, the best leaders have been those that have been engaged. The best leaders have been in those that have actually been part of the team. The best leaders have been those that have communicated. The best leaders have been those that have have managed by walking around. Some of you may remember that old saying from, I think it comes from Drucker's days, MBWA, manage by walking around. How many of our people actually do that anymore? How many of our leaders do? How many of them get out there and actually shake hands with people that look, pe look their employees in the eye? I don't call them employees anymore. I call them team members. Some people in fra are afraid to call them team members because they, they don't see them as team members. They just see them as numbers on their, on their payroll. You see, this model as well, for those of you that are, are actuaries or accountants, please excuse me, but this is not a mathematical model. And most of us know this model is the 10-80-10 model. Because what it basically says is that in any organization, you're going to have a small percentage of, the, of the, the population, if you like, of an organization that are always going to be good. No matter what the environment, how the ethos changes, how, what the climate, how the climate changes, they're always going to be good. On the other end, you have another small group that could be 10%, it could be 20%, it could be 50%. And I think some of our organizations are probably heading in that direction, who are always dodgy. They're going to find a way through any kind of system that the organization has. They're going to uh, look for loopholes and they're going to exploit them. In the middle, you have this group, which we call the corruptible middle. And they will move to the left-hand side or the right-hand side, depending on the leadership that is being shown in the organization. They will move to, depending on the example that is being set by leaders at all levels in the organization. They will move left or right, depending on the ethos of the organization. And the ethos is created by what? It's created by leaders, not only top managers. It's created by leaders who have, have embraced the culture of the business, who have embraced the ethos of the business and the and the, the direction that the business is taking. You can probably t also tell stories, and I certainly can, although I'm obviously not going to mention any names. The number of organizations where I've run workshops over the last five, 10, maybe even 15 years, where the guys come to me afterwards and they say, Brian, thanks very much, you know, blah, blah, blah. Thanks for talking to us, but you should actually be talking to the people on the top floor. That's where the problem is. We understand, we're trying, we're doing our best. But every time we, we try and introduce something, we try and do something, the people on the top floor override it. So guys, we are not hiding to nothing again if our top managers are 
are white anting all the efforts of people at middle and senior management level. Why on earth dairy cows on a talk on ethics? Well, it's probably the best illustration I can give to communication. You see, a lot of people believe, a lot of leaders believe that they've got a commun communication department, they can just get the communication people in, they can write blurbs which go up on the intranet or however they communicate with their people. Um, and a lot of people believe, well, they can do it once a quarter or once a month or something. But the reason why I've got the dairy cow out there is because a good dairy cow has got to be milked every day. And some dairy cows are going to be milked twice a day. And my lesson that I've learned, and certainly how I've tried to behave as a, as a leader throughout my career over the last 30 years or so, <clears throat> is that communication, the best form of communication in, in an organization is from the leaders. The leaders communicate to their people. And I've seen it in, both in my military career in, and in my, my career in the private sector. Uh, the best leaders have been those that have spoken directly to their team members. The best leaders have been those that have walked around, shaken hands, looked people in the eye, listened to their difficulties, listened to their challenges. The people who are constantly out there uh, talking to their people, listening, finding out what's going on, what is really happening in the organization. Unfortunately, you know, in this crazy world we live in, we think that we can just send out a WhatsApp or put something out every day that people, they don't, people don't want that, guys. They want to feel the flesh and blood of their leader. They want to look him in the eye. They want a pat on the back. They want an encouraging word. That's what, that's what people want. And that's what leaders aren't giving people on the train. Then we have the structure within the organization, which is absolutely fundamental. And this is like a spider web. So from top management, you've got to construct the spider web of, um, uh, of, of, of ethics, if you like. And that is created by creating an ethics champion and appointing an ethics champion. And there seems to be a whole lot of uh, dispute around who gets called what and what's an ethics champion. I'm quite clear in my own mind what it is. But then we have this dreadful name of ethics ambassadors, which I can't think of a, a worse word for, for a person than an ethics ambassador. Because I was a diplomat for three years, and I can tell you an ambassador is somebody that you send away far away to do something in a faraway place. Yes, they represent you there, but I can't think of a worse name than ambassador. What they mean is a person that is actually like a first aider, like a paramedic. It's a first line ethics person, so that if anybody wants to talk about something which concerns them or needs guidance or whatever, encouragement, they go to the, call it an ethics ambassador. There's a better word, there are better words, but I'm trying to convince the powers that be that we've got to move away from this dreadful name. But what these people are, they are part of the spider web. So the ethics champion creates these first line people who provide uh, a first line ethics service to everybody in the organization. You see, they're the yeast. They're the yeast in the bread. They're the salt, if you like, in the stew, in the poiki. Without them, your organization is not going to be as good as it can be. You've got to create this. It's almost like reinforcing steel, if you like, for those of you that understand the building industry. You can't build concrete without steel, without reinforcing rods. And these guys and girls are the people that create that firm structure in your organization. So everybody has to be a leader. And you've got to cascade this, this leadership, this engagement, this culture of engagement. You've got to cascade it down so that everybody understands that they are a leader in their own right, and they are embracing the way forward in their own right. You see, Thule said, she said many great things, and she's saying many great things. But she said, for a society to operate properly, every person should be their own policeman. That means that every person should be their own leader. That's where ethics begins, when people start saying, I'm taking responsibility for myself. You see, that's where I have a difficulty with compliance. Some organizations have a compliance department and an ethics department. Some have a compliance and ethics department. And I'm afraid I don't get my head around that one because ethics and compliance are not the same things. Compliance is behavior in terms of somebody else's requirements. You comply with laws and policies and procedures, etc. Now, when people act ethically, they are self-governed. You see, compliance is doing what you're required to do. Ethics is doing what you should do. And the should do part about is when you take ownership 
yourself, when you become a leader in your own right, and you decide that you're going to go that way because that's the way that you believe should be the way to go. You see, Benong Makhali, another great guy, said that no country in the world has ever achieved social cohesion without ethical leadership. Question, do we have social cohesion in South Africa? Perhaps the answer is uh, quite obvious. Do we have ethical leadership in South Africa? I'm not, that's a rhetorical question, by the way. You see, there's a difference between knowing the path and walking the path. And uh, I'm, I, I, please excuse me if I'm sounding cynical this morning, but I'm at the stage in my life where I, I, I feel as if somebody's hitting me on the head with a mallet every minute of every day. Because everything I read, everything I see, everything I hear indicates to me that top leadership is talking a hell of a lot about ethics. But there's not a lot of ethical leadership taking place out there where the rubber meets the road. Now, here's an example, and I call it the credibility gap. That's the gap between what they say and what actually happens on the ground. Now, here's a classic example of what happened in my city. Great, great advert. Jobs and tenders are not for sale. Stamp out fraud and corruption. Brilliant. I couldn't fault that at all. The problem with this thing is that the arrow is pointing to a picture of the ex-mayor. And the ex-mayor is part of a gang of thieves who are in court uh, facing charges uh, of uh, theft and corruption and, and fraud of nearly 600,000 rand. That's 0.6 of a billion rand. You see, she's talking about it. But she's not doing it. In the army, we had a saying, Boer blank and honest stink, means shiny on the outside and stinky on the inside. And that's what I'm finding when I'm visiting organizations. They talk a lot about stuff, but they don't. A lot of it is window dressing. A lot of it is following the tick box approach. And I speak to a lot of people that are involved in what's this new catchphrase is quiet quitting. It's pulling their head out of the scrum. They're actually physically there. They're actually do what they have to do. They go through the, the process of, of pre pretending that they're actually working. But uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? From a, from a heart point of view, they've pulled their head out of the scrum. They no longer buy into the ethics and the ethos of that organization. They're actually there, but they're not there. And the, what a tragedy that is. That's when we see organizations that are just starting to decay and are starting to collapse. Because the people are saying, well, I, I, have to, I have to earn a living, so I'm going to hang around here. I've got two years to go before I go on pension, and uh, I'm just going to see out my time, and I'm not going to rock the boat, and that's me. I'm, I'm here for the next two years. The other problem we have with leadership, and somebody said the other day that to become the president of the United States of America, you have to be uh, a sociopath and a, a narcissist at best, and at worst, you have to be a psychopath. And, you know, a lot of people objected to that. Um, and I think it's absolutely spot on. Because this guy, uh, well, these guys wrote this book called Snakes and Suits. And for those of you that have seen the movie The Wolf in Wall Street will know exactly what I'm talking about. It's about a number of our leaders that are completely out of control. And they are what's known in, in the trade, if you like, as toxic leaders. And when I talk about this in my workshops and when I talk about this in your webinars, the reaction from the people I'm speaking to is, it couldn't, be, it couldn't be clearer. They identify these people in the organization. They're narcissist, narcissistic and self-serving. They're hubristic. They're mavericks. They're rule breakers. They're out of control. They're autocratic. They're over-competitive. They focus on the short term. They're manipulative and bullying. They discriminate and play favorites. They build cliques. They build little cliques of their little psychophants and followers. And, um, and that is a absolute poison. It's a cancer within an organization. Well, another great South African said, and he said it quite clearly, and he says it whenever he can. He said that we need four principles to fix this country. We don't need money. We need spirituality, morality, values, and ethics. You fix that, you fix the country. Now, who can argue with that? The thing I like about Imtiaz is that he's not just talking about stuff. Where is he? If you don't, you open your eyes when he's in the next day, he's in the Middle East. You open your eyes the next day, he's in some disaster area where there's just been an earthquake. You open your eyes and he's in, in Beaufort West, sinking waterholes, sinking 
uh, uh, Waterholt. You see, he's a guy that's actually engaged. He's a leader that's engaged. He's not a leader that's out there for his ego. He's not a leader that's out there for the money. He's not an ego out there for all the bells and whistles that, that most people fancy uh, as being the rewards of top leadership. He's, he knows where he's going and he's showing the way. You see, ethics is not a buffet. And this is another area where I find in my experience, a lot of people think ethics, I'll give you a classic example. I, I, about three, four years ago, before COVID, I did a, a workshop one very cold morning in Johannesburg. And that's why I'm happy webinars are, are, are more popular because I don't like those July and August mornings in Johannesburg. But anyway, to cut a long story short, I had a, about 20 people at this workshop. And when I got back to my laptop, uh, when I opened my laptop again later that afternoon, I saw that there was a, a, co a copy of um, uh, one of these books, Jacques Poe's book, actually, it was, uh, which the guide sent me. It was a PDF copy. It was a pirate copy. So he'd been sitting in my workshop the whole day, and it hadn't dawned on him that this wasn't a cool thing to do. He, he went away there raving about the workshop, but it, he didn't put one and one together. You see, he was out there thinking that it was a buffet, that he could be good in one area and stinky in another area, that he could do the right thing in one area, but the wrong thing in another. He thought that was completely cool. And that's what I find as well is with what's, what's called the silo effect. And in the old days when I used to do a lot of investigations and we used to arrest, arrest people, the guy would often say, or the woman sometimes would often say, but I'm a very good mom, or I'm a very good dad. They seemed to think that there was a, there were, it was okay to do different things in different parts of their lives. And of course that doesn't work. And I love the story that I like to tell about this couple that went to a fast food outlet got their order in a big brown packet, got back to their car, drove home, got home, opened the brown packet and discovered it was full of cash. And obviously what had happened is the, the owner of the fast food or the manager of the fast food outlet had, uh, in error, had switched the brown bags and he'd taken his bag that he was going to take to the bank and he'd given them that bag instead of giving them their meal. So being good, honest, hardworking people, this couple got back into their car, drove back to the the fast food outlet and said, explain to the guy what had happened. And he was, of course, was completely over the moon and delighted. And um, he said, please, you've just got to, we've got to take a photograph of you. We need to put it on our website. We need to put it on our, on our newsletter. And the guy said, look, don't worry about that. Just give us a new meal. And we're happy to have done, you know, what we thought was the good thing to do. Here's your, um, uh, here's your bag back. And the guy insisted, he wanted the photographs back. And eventually the guy, uh, came over to the guy and whispered in his ear. He said, well, listen, but we don't want any photographs taken because we marry. But the, the problem is we're not married to each other. You see, that's a classic example of people behaving in a certain way, in a principled way in one part of their life and in another part of their life, they don't. The other huge problem with leadership, and I'll say it quite blatantly and boldly, one of the biggest problems we have with leadership in South Africa at all levels and in private and public sector is that a lot of our leaders are compromised. They're like dear old Jonathan Swift Gulliver, who arrives in Lilliput and he wakes up and he finds that he's been completely tied down by the Lilliputians and he can't move, he can't get up, he can't, he, well, he can probably lift his head slightly, but he can't move his arms and he can't move his legs. And that's the situation we find ourselves in, where nothing is happening to the crooks in South Africa because the people that have got to do something about the crooks are also crooks. So why is a crook going to do something about a, a crook that's part of his team if everybody knows that he's also a crook? And unless we can deal with this problem in South Africa, we're going to go nowhere. You can see it. Open a newspaper. Look at a post on, on social media, on LinkedIn, or on, on YouTube, or anywhere. You'll find that this is exactly what's happening. That leaders at all levels are not able to do what they should be doing because they compromised. And I don't know how we're going to change this. Uh, I'm almost some days I wake up and I think that the, we've already re, we already passed the tipping point, that there are already more crooks than there are good people. And I hope I'm wrong, but sometimes I just get swamped with a tsunami of negativism where I just can't believe the stuff that's happening blatantly in lighter in the in the in, in the light of day, and we expect it to believe that it's okay.
well, here's a good guy on the, on the positive side. Some people think he's a very controversial guy, but let's just leave that aside for the moment to talk about this quote. He said that ethical leadership leaves no room for corruption. And I often think of it as a, as a cardboard box, like a, a metrophile box or something similar. If you fill that up with, with ethical leadership, and you fill that up with values, and you fill that up with, with good stuff, there's no room in that box for bad stuff to come in. And that's the same with an organization. From top management down to the bottom, everybody has got to be a leader. Everybody has got to embrace the, the, the values, You've got to embrace the vision and mission, and then there's no room. There's no room for the bad guys. That bad 10% that shouldn't even, and that's another sore point that I have. I believe that our, our whole system of background checks, our verifications is appalling. That we are, we are recruiting on the basis of, of skills, experience, and diversity, but we never, or very, very seldom, do we recruit on the basis of integrity. And we need to sort that out sooner rather than later. Now, here's an example of a leader. You probably don't even know who he is. I didn't. He happens to be the president of Switzerland. And why is he sitting on the curbside? Well, here's his story. This was in a newspaper in Kenya a couple of years ago. When African heads of state were being chauffeured in huge convoys and spending nights in luxurious hotels in New York, the president of the Swiss Confederation was cooking his own meals and sharing a room in a small apartment he rented for his delegation of five people. Every morning he would walk to the UN General, the UN headquarters. This is him working on the files, on his files on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly. The, the guy that wrote this put in the note that the GDP of Switzerland is nine times that of Kenya. You see, how many of those leaders do we see around us? I, in my, my webinars, I spent about half an hour in uh, my workshop, I spent about half an hour talking about, about other examples, and there are many. But they're not enough of them. They're not enough people that are humble, that are engaged, that are setting an example, that are doing the right thing. Here's another good guy. Some of us know him very well. He says that leadership is about lighting candles. It's about dispelling the darkness, like my, my, um, my light. It's not about fighting it. It's about creating it. And that's what I love about this quote. It's not about fighting madly in the dark. It's about shining the light. It's about, it's about creating the, the, the good places. It's about uh, accentuating the good things that are happening. It's about rewarding the good things that are happening. I love that because it's a creative and it's a positive thought. Now, here's a, an example. Some of you may know this business. They're on my low-hanging fruit list, and I'm really hoping to get a chance to work there. But a little while ago, I, uh, a friend of mine works there. And I popped in to visit him, and there was a, this is in their training section, by the way. Um, there was a group of about 30 people being trained. And I said, oh, what's going on here? And he said, no, that's our, our onboarding course. It's a five-day course. And I said, who's doing the training? And he said, no, that's the CEO. He does, of the five days, he does three days of the training. Because he believes, he calls it an, an, a cultural blood transfusion. You see, that's what I'm talking about when I talk about ethical leadership. He values, he owns, he embraces the ethos of that organization. So much so that he doesn't trust anybody else in the organization to, to engage themselves in that, in that, um, that, that um, cultural uh, blood transfusion, if you like. He wants to do it himself. He wants to put the stamp on it himself. And here we have another example of a thing that started out in, in New York, two academics, two PhDs wrote a brilliant paper called The Broken Window Theory. And it was adapted and adopted by the uh, New York Police Department and a guy by the name of Bill Bratton. And he and, and Rudy Giuliani, who was the mayor at the time, the two of them put this in place in New York. And the crime figures dropped dramatically, the major crimes. And the whole thing was based on the broken window. And the, the whole philosophy behind it is sort out the small things, sort out the minor infractions, deal with the stuff that's it's happening at lower level. Have a zero tolerance approach and sort out the small stuff and then the big stuff will go. And they proved over about a 10 year period, the, the, the drop in major crime in New York City dropped dramatically. Well, it's back where it was before. And this is what we call the thin edge of the wedge. If you get the thin edge of the wedge, if you allow that into your organization, if you, if you 
allow any nastiness to come in, if you allow any unethical behavior, if you condone it, you're heading for a, for a high. Another one, people say, why do you put this in? Well, it's a great, I think it's a great picture. It's a great story. And for most guys, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Your partner, wife, whatever they call them these days, comes into the TV room, you're sitting there watching sport, and she says, darling, do these jeans make my backside look big? Now, you know uh, that there are a couple of ways you can approach this. You know that if you do it in a certain way, there are going to be certain consequences for you. If you do it in another way, there might be other consequences for you. So how do you deal with it? Well, the bottom line is that you have to be brave. And the lesson from this thing is that you, you, you need to find ways of saying what needs to be said, but you don't have to be a bore about it. You can do it diplomatically and you can do it nicely. But the bottom line, as far as we're concerned, in ethics, is you have to have courage. You have to stand up and say what needs to be said when it needs to be said. You cannot adopt the ostrich approach and just hide your head under the sand and hope that it's going to work, go away. You see, on the airplane, as you know, the announcement is made that in the event of a problem, the, the uh, oxygen mask is going to drop down from, from, the, from the, uh, the ceiling above you. It says there quite clearly, before you worry about anybody else, Put your own mask on. Once your own mask is secured securely, then you worry about kids and old people that are battling to put theirs on. The moral of the story is, let's get our own ethical lives sorted out. You see, everybody talks about changing the world, but no one wants to change the roll of toilet paper or fill the kettle. That bugs me. I'd love to have one of those in, in some of the toilets that I go to. See, I always wondered why somebody didn't do something about that. Then I realized that I'm that somebody. I love this picture. I really love this picture because it's, it, it shows you that a humble match can change the course of history. By that match deciding, hang on, I'm not getting involved in this. Hang on, I'm stepping away from this. Hang on, I'm not going to follow the sheep. I'm going to stand aside and not get involved in this nastiness that's happening around. They can make the difference. They can change the world. How's this guy? I mean, this was that Suez Canal, that tanker that got stuck there a year or two ago. This guy in the JCB has got no chance in help of moving that tanker with that JCB. But he said, I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to stand up. Me. I'm the guy. I'm going to see if I can do something about it. And a lot of people said to me, oh, Ron, don't be, don't be naive. Uh, I'm only one person. You're only one person. But people who say that have never spent a night alone with these kids. And those of us that live in Africa know that these little guys can make your life a misery. And what the, the moral of the story, of course, is that a single bee is ignored. But when millions come together, even the bravest run in fear. So the one single thing that's going to turn South Africa from a country plagued by dishonesty and corruption into an ethical one, Steph Platter's moment, it's me. You see, Nothing else is going to change that. Nothing else is going to. It's not going to be a general uh, Devet that's going to come back. It's not going to be Madiba that's going to come back. It's not going to be Mother Teresa. It's not going to be another Messiah that's going to come. The only thing that's going to change the way that the trajectory of this country is me and you. Coming to the end, one of my heroes as an ex-soldier was this very controversial character. And starting out as I did with a military uh, example, a couple of years after that, this guy was very involved in eventually uh, liberating uh, big parts of Germany. And he was a, actually a bit of a wild character, but he said in one of his talks to his men, and he was one of those leaders that used to get all these guys together and he would talk to them. Some of the guys that I served with used to get us all together Hundreds and maybe even thousands of us would talk on the radio, make speeches on the radio. So we could all... Anyway, Patton said, 30 years from now, when you're sitting by your fireside with your grandson on your knee, and he asks, what did you do in the Great World War II? You won't have to cough and say, well, your granddaddy shoveled horse manure in Louisiana. No, sir. You can look him straight in the eye and say, son, your granddaddy rode with a great third army and the son of a goddamn bitch named George Patton. So my question to you today 
and to everybody that might watch or listen to this, is what are you going to tell your grandkids in 20 years' time when, you, when they're sitting on your knee and they say to you, Grandpa or Granny or Oma or Opa, what did you do in South Africa in 2003 when South Africa was falling apart? What, what did you do to stop the ethical collapse of South Africa? And that's the question I want to leave with you. You see, you can be a warrior or you can be a warrior. And I'm hoping that I've convinced you that you need to be a warrior. Thanks for listening. And, and uh, thank you, Cynthia and Stefan, for the opportunity. I hope I didn't become uh, sound too much like a pastor towards the end. But um, I do get passionate about this. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity. And uh, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to share a minute or two of questions if there are. Thank you, Brian. Um... I mean, as always, I mean, this is not the first time I've attended uh, your webinars. And I mean, I just get reminded about why you are such an esteemed speaker. I mean, for me personally, I mean, I just love the metaphors that you use and the examples that you use, you know, and, and, and that kind of gets stuck in your mind. So when you encounter something like that again, you know, you just, your brain just immediately kind of conjure up that image that you, you left with us. And I think that's, that's, that's so great. And to bring the practical side of things to it is, is, is absolutely brilliant. So um, I really enjoy your, your webinars. And I mean, ethical leadership is, is, is something that's very close to the EPA's heart. I mean, as you said, Cynthia is driving this, uh, you know, ethical capital and the return on integrity hard. And, uh, you know, and that's always the argument that I believe you can take to your, to your executives where you need to justify your existence, justify the existence of, of an ethics framework and an office is that there is actually a return on investment in the form of return on, on, on integrity. So very valuable yeah. points. I, I really enjoyed it. I don't know if there are any questions, people. Um, Sarah, please assist. I think you've got access to, to those. I mean, if there's any questions for Brian. Hi. <clears throat> no, we, we actually haven't had questions. We've just had thank yous and hand clapping. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Brian. And I think, um, yeah, and just, a, just a, a kind of real sense of appreciation from all the people that have been here. Yeah, thank you. Brian, on, on that note, thank you very much, everyone. We really appreciate it. Um, Brian, thank you so much again. We really, really um, uh, are grateful to have you as one of our EPSA members. And if there's any questions, we're absolutely happy to facilitate it. So thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Have a great day and uh, all the best. Thank you very much.